My name is Jay Sugarman, and I want to welcome you to Museum Open House. This ongoing series features and highlights many of the outstanding museums and other cultural institutions. The main purpose of most programs is to inform viewers about current and upcoming exhibits, various programs, resources, and other opportunities that are available for the general public. Today via Zoom, we're fortunate to have as our guest, Melissa Ziobro. Melissa is the curator at the Bruce Springsteen Archives and Center for American Music, which is located at Monmouth University, where Melissa also serves as the Director of Public History. During the program, we're learning why and how the Bruce Springsteen Archives and Center for American Music came about. We'll go on a behind the scenes tour and in the process come to better understand and appreciate the institution's overall mission, its extensive collection of items and artifacts, and the various programs, exhibits, events, and other opportunities that are available for the general public. Let's start by meeting Melissa and then finding out all about the Bruce Springsteen Archives and Center for American Music. Welcome, Melissa. So delighted to be able to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I love what you're doing with this program and I'm delighted to be a part of it. Thank you so much. And I know you've prepared an outstanding presentation for us to learn and enjoy. Before we jump right to that, I think it would be of interest if we just hear maybe a little bit more about your background, professional interests, current position, please. Sure. So I am Jersey Shore, born and raised. I am actually a Monmouth University alum, so fly hawks. <laughs> and my first big person job out of college is as a command historian for the U.S. Army Communications Electronics Command at Fort Monmouth here in central Jersey. So the command historians, we ran an archive that dated back primarily to the 1917 founding of Fort Monmouth during World War I. We would handle roughly 500 research requests per year. These requests would come in from family members and authors and filmmakers from elsewhere within the Army. Um, we wrote the annual command history at the point I was there from 2004 to 2011. We're really documenting what the command is doing in support of operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. We had an oral history program where we, you know, one day might be interviewing folks from World War II or someone coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. It was very busy, but very fulfilling work. And I was so proud to be supporting our active duty military and our veterans. But the Department of Defense decided to close Fort Monmouth and my job transferred to Aberdeen Proving Ground, Maryland. Mm -hmm. I always joke that I resigned in protest rather than leave the great state of New Jersey. So, you know, I was on a job hunt um, and I was very fortunate to move back to my alma mater, Monmouth University, full time. Um, as a full-time faculty member in the Department of History and Anthropology. I had been teaching as an adjunct since I finished my master's in 2007. This is how much I love history. I had a full-time mm -hmm. job. I was a newlywed, and I still wanted to come here and teach history at night, right? So um, I, <laughs> I was able to turn that then into a full-time role after Fort Monmouth closed. And I just, I never intended to teach, but I loved it teach a wide variety of classes, um, Western Civ, history in Hollywood, US history, New Jersey history, the Vietnam War. But my specialty, um, what I'm most proud of are these classes I've started for students who want to do public history themselves. So I teach students to do what I did at Fort Monmouth, right? So museums and archives management basics, oral history, um, historic preservation, Etc. cetera. Um, loved that position, loved the Department of History and Anthropology, but uh, just this past August, August of 23, I was lured from my faculty role over to this new position as curator of the Bruce Springsteen Archives and Center for American Music, because as we're going to discuss in the next few minutes, there is some exciting growth planned here. Most definitely, most definitely. Well, for the sake of time, and we can get as much out of the program as possible, I'm going to turn it over to you, let you screen share, and take us through the institution. 
Yes. So, um, you know, everyone, Jay and I were talking about how the program would run. And I said, I just so happen to have this handy presentation I've been doing. <laughs> so I hope you'll enjoy hearing a little bit about how the archives comes to be, what we are currently doing, and our really, really big plans for the future. Um you know, I, I don't know that I noted this. I, in my faculty role, have been working with the Bruce Springsteen Archives and Center for American Music since 2016, because mm -hmm. having this archive here on campus is like the perfect laboratory for public history students. So my students and I have been partnering with the archives for years. This here is just a little photo of an exhibit we did with the Monmouth County Historical Association in Freehold for Bruce's 70th birthday mm -hmm. in 2019. Uh, so this is me and our director, Eileen Chapman, with Bruce um, walking him through the exhibit in September of 2019. Um, well, maybe I should, I always have to remind myself that not everybody knows Bruce as closely as we do here at the archive. So a little refresher for anyone, a little context on why this Bruce Springsteen Archives and Center for American Music is here at the Jersey Shore. Bruce, right, is one of New Jersey's most famous exports. <laughs> <laughs> Baby Bruce here is born um, at a hospital in Long Branch here in central New Jersey on September 23rd, 1949 to Adele Zarilli and Douglas Springsteen. So, you know, he lives his whole life here in Freehold, you know, his childhood, his formative years. The Springsteens are a Catholic, Irish, Italian, working class family who are, as Bruce writes in his autobiography, often surrounded by music. Um, he talks about his mom and uh, her sisters, his aunts in particular, loving music and always singing and dancing. Um, and between those influences and Elvis and the Beatles, Bruce gets the music bug. He's bit by the music bug. And he joins his first real band, the Castiles, in 1965. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Castiles break up as high school bands do. And Bruce experiments with a few other bands before finally achieving that really rare goal, right, of getting a recording contract. Mm -hmm. His first two albums come out in 1973. The first one is Greetings from Asbury Park, New Jersey, and he very, very purposefully markets himself as a New Jersey musician from the beginning, where a lot of people, you know, it would have been easier to say you're from New York. He's very much a Jersey guy from the very beginning. So it's Greetings from Asbury Park, New Jersey, and then The Wild, The Innocent, and The A Street Shuffle. Now, those first two albums, they get a lot of critical acclaim, and he's got a huge following here in New Jersey and also, interestingly, in Virginia, but they're not huge sellers. And in fact, Bruce is facing a bit of a make or break moment in his career until he comes out with Born to Run in 1975, and it is an absolute smashing success. Bruce famously appears simultaneously on the covers of Time and Newsweek that year, and it really signals that he has made it, right? All of a sudden, he has become this international phenomenon. Um, I always find it so interesting that by all accounts, he is a bit baffled and, and, and perhaps horrified by it all, right? This, this level of attention. Bruce quickly decides that if he's going to have a platform, it's fun. Yes, his concerts are known for being like a wild party, but also he wants to use his platform for causes that he supports. And one of the earliest will be Vietnam veterans. Um, but he's also used his music to support causes like income inequality and food insecurity, et cetera, et cetera. So, to this day, Bruce is still selling out stadiums as we record this. He's getting ready to go back on tour um, and winning not just accolades from within the recording industry, but also honors like the Presidential Medal of Freedom. So this is a man whose songs whose career reflects over 50 years of American history. So that is just the tiniest overview on Bruce's life and work. It could easily be a semester long class, and it is at a Incredible. lot of institutions, right? <laughs> um, not to mention the scores of books that are written about him, but we'll have to leave it there for today. 
So what is this Bruce Springsteen Archives and Center for American Music? Well, officially, it's our official line, the Bruce Springsteen Archives and Center for American Music preserves the legacy of Bruce Springsteen and celebrates the history of American music and its diversity of artists and genres. So it really is two parts. The Bruce Springsteen Archives and the Center for American Music. And that's something we are keen to point out. That's something Bruce himself wanted. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, because as the Center for American Music, we have this enormous opportunity to tell American history, to interrogate American history through the very accessible prism of music. So what's the backstory? How does this all start? It does start as all about Bruce. <laughs> so we're going way back to very early in the 21st century, and there's a group of Bruce Springsteen fans. They come together and they form the Friends of the Bruce Springsteen Special Collection. Now, Bruce has dedicated fans around the globe, and often fans of anything. Fans collect stuff. In the case of musicians, they collect concert stubs, ticket stubs, and bootleg recordings, and they're taking photographs, and they've got the tour t-shirts, right? So a group of fans comes together and says, we've got all this stuff. We think there'd be public interest in it, right? So they kind of pool their collections, and they find a home for it at the Asbury Park Public Library. Asbury Park has its own, you know, storied history and, and just strong ties, thanks to the Stone Pony and other clubs, to American music history. So it finds a home at the Asbury Park Library. To make a long story short, in the interest of time, the Asbury Park Library quickly becomes... Uh, inundated, overwhelmed <laughs> by this, right? We give them so much credit for the work they did at the beginning, but it goes from being this one closet of Bruce Springsteen materials to now people are sending, they hear about this mission and they're just sending stuff from around the globe, you know, so they quickly run out of space, not to mention that people want to come visit the archive, but I mean, it's not a museum, so you can't really just have people coming and pawing through boxes of stuff, you know, it, it was not a long-term solution to what's quickly a project that's gaining steam. And so again, condensing in the interest of time, my now colleagues, Eileen Chapman and a gentleman by the name of Bob Santelli, who's also a Mammoth alum, but then goes on to you know run the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and the Grammy Museum mm -hmm. at various points in wow. his career. They start to lobby to bring this collection to Mammoth University. And we'll talk about why Mammoth in a little bit. But they pull it off in 2011, although they're all manner of institutions that would have loved to have this collection, they bring it to Mammoth. Now, interestingly, it doesn't get um, kind of worked into our library. It becomes its own freestanding entity here at Mammoth. And the university donates this um, residential Cape Cod style house to put everything in just, you know, to find a temporary solution to the safe housing of the collection. So that's 2011 and the collection continues to grow and Eileen Chapman and volunteers are making sure everything is properly cataloged. And then we take a huge leap forward when in 2017, Bruce decides that we will be his official repository. And so that's when we go from being the friends of the Bruce Springsteen Special Collection to the Bruce Springsteen Archives and Center for American Music. Mm -hmm. That Center for American Music piece is largely because Bruce doesn't want it to be just about him. He wants it to have this broader significance, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, um, you know, my colleagues, uh, Eileen and Bob, saw enormous educational potential there as well, if we were the Bruce Springsteen Archives and Center for American Music. So now you are Bruce Springsteen's official repository, but you're in this tiny house. You are out of space. More and more people want to come visit you and you can't really accommodate them. Do you know what we need? we need a brand new custom-built museum facility. Wow. 
And so just this past October, as I said, I came on in August. They were growing the team in anticipation of announcing the new building. So it was in October that Bruce came to campus and we had a lovely event where we were able to announce that we are embarking on this building project. It will be a 30,000 square foot building, wow. which will house a roughly 250 seat auditorium and two stories of exhibits in addition to the archive where people can mm -hmm. come still and do research. So the building has been designed by the acclaimed uh, New York architecture firm, Cook Fox. And we've been working with them every step of the way. Um, we are raising some $45 million for the building. The money is not coming out of Monmouth University funds. So no funding that would have gone to like the School of Science or the lacrosse team is being siphoned off to us. We are particularly, um, you know, my... Uh, our executive director, Bob Santelli, is working really, really hard to fundraise for this. We are a little over two thirds of the way there. Mm. We hope to break ground in the next few months. Um, there are some other construction projects happening on the campus that must be finished first before we open. So we're hoping to break ground in this spring, roughly sometime, um, mm -hmm. and then open in the spring of 2026, which is um, exciting in general, but especially because it's going to be the semi-quincentennial, right? So we get to open during that very special period in our nation's history. Fabulous. Yes, yes. So shall I tell you just a little bit about the exhibit themes? Oh, please do. Okay, so here's another artist's rendering. When you come into the museum on the first floor, the first thing you're going to see is an exhibit on Indigenous music history, because we thought it was very important to acknowledge um, our Indigenous um links here, particularly um, here in, in Monmouth County, and we'll be working with Indigenous advisors to ensure that we are thorough and sensitive and appropriate at all times, but we thought that was really important. So nice. that's the first thing you'll see. Then much of the first floor galleries are dedicated to the broad story of American music history from the first colonial settlers who come over and they're bringing their hymnals with them through the evolution of more secular music, um, you know, all the way through to the present. I'll talk a little more um, in a moment about our Music America exhibit, which looks at 250 years of American music history. And our earliest artifact is a 1771 hymnal, and then we go all the way through to Taylor Swift's guitar. So <laughs> we're going to tell a comprehensive narrative about the ways music has shaped us and also reflects our American story. Then when we go upstairs, we'll have exhibits on Bruce Springsteen's songwriting process, his live performances, and the E Street Band. So those are the major galleries. And then there are these other little exhibits that'll be tucked away here and there. Just cannot wait for everyone to see it. It's a lot of work ahead of us, but I can't wait for everyone <laughs> to see it. Um, why is this at Monmouth University? I kind of foreshadowed this a little earlier. This is an artist rendering of what the interior might look like. You see the New Jersey postcard on the left there, but, but nice. why Monmouth? Um, this is another image of the Fabulous. archives, potential rendering that you can see. Well, this is Bruce playing at Monmouth. Um, Bruce is not a Monmouth alum. He tried a semester at Ocean County College, which is about 40, 45 minutes south of here, and decided it wasn't for him. But and it's worked out just fine for him, I'd say. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but he grew up in Freehold, which is roughly 25 minutes from here. He wrote Born to Run, that breakthrough album, just down the street. He played at Monmouth University many times. You see behind me our marquee building, uh, the Great Hall. This is him playing in front of that building. Nice. Uh, so he played here something like nine times in the you know latter 60s and early 70s. You know, and, and he was just born and raised here. And he could have raised his family anywhere in the world, but he chose to do it here in Monmouth County. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it was key that it stay local and... Being on a university campus, I think, really reinforces the fact that, yes, this will be a tourist destination, but it will also be a center of learning. We want researchers 
filling our archives. We want class trips coming constantly. And I think having it on a university campus really helps facilitate that educational potential. Um, I mentioned earlier, we currently have this tiny Cape Cod house. You can see this is actually a tour I gave yesterday to a contingent from Ireland. Uh, these folks came from the hometown of one of Bruce Springsteen's ancestors to visit. Wow. I could barely fit everybody in the house at once, though. Wow. <laughs> right? So, I mean, we are just bursting at the seams. We are secure and we are climate control. So that's key. Right. Um, but we're just bursting at the seams for the ambitious plans that we have for ourselves. Um, everything is stored properly in archival materials. As I said, we do make sure everything is cataloged, um, but we just need to take that next step forward. Um, what do we have? What's in these boxes? What, what treasures are hidden in these boxes? Let me tell you a little bit about the types of things we have in our collection. Gosh, all manner of stuff. We've got things from Bruce's early life, right? We go back to his childhood, um, his yearbook. Um, this was a Little League program that talks about him. That's his term paper there on the right. Um, gosh, these are pieces of wall from the Upstage Club. It was a club in Asbury Park that was really important to Bruce in his formative years. And when they were you know, going to be gutting the space, my colleague Eileen Chapman was able to get in there and make sure we saved pieces of the wall. Wow. Um, certainly more serious items as well. This hero is Bart Haynes. He was the drummer in Bruce's early band, The Castiles, who died in Vietnam. And, and Bruce talks movingly about how uh, Bart comes to one last practice in his uniform and he's talking about how he couldn't even find Vietnam on a map mm -hmm. and he goes and so so tragically is killed there um, this is his purple heart which we often coordinate the display of with the New Jersey Vietnam Veterans Memorial Foundation um, and then some really personal items I often get asked what's your favorite item in the collection it's hard that's like picking your favorite child but <laughs> i love the things that came from adele springsteen bruce's mom so for example she made scrapbooks from the earliest stages of his career she didn't know he was going to be famous she's just a mom like me i think this is why I you know i relate to it so much who loved her kids and so we can see her scrapbooks um i was just yesterday talking to one of our wonderful volunteer archivists marianne and she said her favorite item is a letter that adele's sister sends her so bruce's aunt is writing this letter and she says I saw Brucey's show last night and it was wonderful, but he's too skinny. He's not eating enough, right? And so <laughs> these really rare, special insights into his, his personal life, which I think are so interesting and tell us importantly about how he becomes the person that he is. Um, we also have things that come, of course, directly from Bruce. As I said, we are now his official repository. So alternate album covers. The record company would actually mock up alternate album covers, and he could pick what he wanted. So on the left, we have the famous Born in the USA cover, uh, and then alternate samples of ones he could have picked. Um, little things like this was so popular at the Springsteen His Hometown exhibit in Freehold in 2019. Keys that it was such a novelty for the band to be staying in hotels that they would sneak <laughs> keys home with them when they left because it was a souvenir that they had stayed in hotels, right? Um, things, you know, from Bruce himself. Here we see his guitar, some clothing on the left. So it's a really, really special collection that's really broad reaching now of course we are also the center for american music we will never even in the new building have enough space to also collect everything related to american music history more broadly but we are acquiring objects as needed to tell stories so for example this is an edison standard phonograph mm. that was donated for our exhibit music america I'll just briefly mention in the moments I have remaining that even though we don't have a museum facility currently, we are doing exhibits, traveling exhibits, using other people's space. So I mentioned Springsteen, his hometown, and Freeholds. Um, we just had a small exhibit, a Christmas-themed exhibit at Kane University, um, Bart Haynes' Purple Heart. We facilitated the loan of that and some other materials to the National Liberty Museum in 
Philadelphia Music America, which I've referenced, just opened at the Lyndon Johnson Presidential Library and Museum. My goodness, what a show that is. Um, you know, things from Ray Charles, uh, alongside examples of technology like the first transistor radio. It's really wow. special. So we are doing exhibits and we do a lot of programming. Um, our big uh, fundraising event for the year is something called American Music Honors, where we are, this is just our second year, will be coming up um, in April, where we give awards to musicians who have had a tremendous impact, uh, both on the musical world and on their activism and philanthropy. Um, we're doing something called the Presidential Lecture Series, where we will bring nationally recognized scholars in to talk about the intersections of music, history, and contemporary music uh, American life. Um, yeah, so I mean, we are just really busy, even as we prepare to launch the museum. So uh, I've enjoyed telling you a little bit about it in the time that we have. And I hope, Jay, that I haven't gone over too much. If anyone wants more information, I encourage them to find us on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, Spotify, you name it. Or you can visit our website, which is Springsteen Archives. Dot org. So let me stop yapping so that Jay can get a question or two in if time allows. <laughs> well, Melissa, that was outstanding. And the upcoming plans are so exciting. I mean, it's going to be a must go to destination. In Jay, I hope someday you'll come and you'll walk it. Maybe we could do a walking tour in two years and show everybody the museum. Oh, <laughs> would really enjoy that and look forward to it, look forward to it. You know, in the two minutes or so we have left, time well spent for your presentation, just some reactions and feedback you get from the multitude of visitors, maybe even just yesterday's group. Yes, it's such a variety, right? Because, you know, you have people come who are diehard fans, right? Um, I had an individual from France who, you know, this, I had a group from France show up and I was getting ready to leave and they didn't have an appointment, but I'm thinking, I'm, of course, I'm not going to turn them away. So I'm giving them a tour. And it was so impactful that some of them were almost in tears, you know, because mm -hmm. you just... I think that Bruce's music, for some, it's just fun. It's a casual part of their lives. But for some, and and this is music more broadly, whoever your favorite artist is, it almost becomes an emotional attachment to therapy for you. Mm -hmm. So we have fans come who are almost moved to tears. Then we have sometimes students come, and, and many students are fans, but there are also some who have never heard of Bruce and who are walking around the archives, and it's a new experience for them. And they pick up a cassette tape, and they're like, what is this? You know what I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so it's just such a spectrum of reactions and I truly I love and appreciate them all I think we have a lot of different constituencies we are there for the fans we are there for the historians we are there for the educators we are there for the students I mean and and what a, an honor it is to be able to do that work Wonderful, wonderful. Well, Melissa, unfortunately, we've come to the end of the program. Want to thank you again. This has really been a special episode. Uh, look forward to staying in touch, following upcoming developments, and perhaps collaborating again. Wonderful. I would love that. And again, everybody visit springsteenarchives.org if you want any more information. Thank you so much, Jay. Pleasure, pleasure. Also want to thank those of you watching for joining us and hope you'll be able to tune in next time.